it's just me again. But I get the unique privilege of being able to introduce Joe Dorhout. Um, we were arguing in the green room beforehand who's been around the longest, uh, Orchard Hill Church, and uh, I think you get the prize, right? Uh, no, because Kevin grew up here. Oh, no, I'm, that's I'm not right. I'm from here. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin up in the booth back there. Yeah, he, was, he got baptized here. That's right. Right. That's right. Joe, we are really, really grateful that you are here and you've been willing to share your story well, with us this morning. Thank you very yeah, much. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Well, thank All you right. very much. Thank you, Joe. You know, I'm wondering why we stopped the band. Wasn't that music fabulous? Thank you, musicians. I love it. And good morning to all of you. I have to say that I feel a lot more comfortable sitting out there uh, giving hugs to all of you than I do uh, standing up here. But I'm here and we do welcome those two that are online with us this morning. Many of our dear friends join us and thank you so much. For 40 years, my husband Gary and I have been actively, actively involved here at Orchard Hill. Um, thank you to all you absolutely wonderful people who have made an eternal investment in our lives. Some of you know our children, Leanne and David, who are with me today, and I just have to give a shout out. I have California, Texas, and my sister from Florida is here, so thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate that. <laughs> Some of you will remember Leanne and David, and I just have to make a side note. There was a classmate of hers sitting behind me this morning in the chairs, and sure enough, true to nature, Leanne may have a job of responsibility now, but she did not bother to read the sign on the door as typical and disobeyed the rules when she was growing up. So <laughs> some things never, never, ever change in life. And Gary is living with our Heavenly Father. Uh, my marriage and family have brought me nothing less than absolutely wonderful joy. Uh, we've had so much fun and so many adventures together, laughing until we thought we were going to roll over. But from early on, I don't really know that I knew what the Lord had planned for me. And just to clarify, one thing I knew he did not have planned for me was to be a theologian. And so today, I am only sharing with you what I realize as I reflect back on my life. And that is, our Lord has created us each uniquely to fulfill his plan. He promises to be with us and to help us. We, as his people, need to be nudged by the Holy Spirit so that we can reflect his love and care to others. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Every day we have plans. You know, out the door, by 7.32, gets us to school by 7.38, just before the tardy bell at 7.40. However, at 7.29, a glass of spilled milk over somebody's lap. So out the window went those plants. A huge blizzard. Awesome. An entire night to sit in, do nothing, just snuggle and be warm. Until... Son leaps over the bed, hits his head on the chest. To the ER we go, out in the blizzard. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. In my decades of living, I've experienced plans, especially life plans, that go just as planned and other ones where I go, where in the world did that come from? I was born Joanne Faye Gosswick. I'm I was the youngest of four kids, big, two big brothers, Arlen and Stan, and a big sister, Bev. I'm the one on that picture, the big one in pink. 
My little sister was born 10 years later, uh, Margie. So I grew up a normal childhood with my big brothers and sisters either taking really good care of me or totally putting the blame on me for something they had done wrong. We went to church every Sunday, and I got to go to Sunday school dressed in my very most beautiful dress, matching hat sometimes, gloves, purse, shoes, you know, the whole 10 yards. It was awesome. But I loved hearing those Bible stories, especially the one of Jesus where he says, let the little children come to me. My paternal grandparents had the picture of Jesus with the children on their wall. I would love to sit and just stare at that picture as a child and wish I was one of those children sitting on his lap. And you know, it was not hard to understand Jesus' love for me because the, my paternal grandparents oozed love and fun all over you. It was awesome. It was also easy for me to understand our Heavenly Father's love for us because my earthly daddy would hold me, read stories to me, fix jigsaw puzzles for hours while we talked, and when I was a tiny little girl, he told me how beautiful I looked in my new yellow dress. Although at the time, I was gaunt, skinny, head wrapped in bandages, anything but pretty. But guess what my favorite color is today? <laughs> this was my experience. If this is not the reality for you, remember, you have a Heavenly Father who loves you with a perfect love. And he is so proud of you because he created you uniquely and for his purpose. When I was three, I had an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin. I was seriously ill with, the, with extremely high temperatures and the only visual sign was a tiny little blister on the top of my head. I was brought to a specialist, Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank and his wife, who was also his nurse, worked tirelessly to save my life, using many, many normal approaches, but also one very on uh, a different approach. They pulled out all the hair on the top of my head. What gave him the knowledge to do that? Through those months in the hospital, I do not remember any of the pain, but I do remember being held tightly, rocked gently, and feeling such peace in those arms as I was being held. I made a full recovery, in case you can't tell, and enjoyed some status quo. Daydreamed a lot about being a doctor, just like Dr. Frank, so I could help other people. And at the same time, fighting with my big sister, to get over on her side of the bed. So it was a very normal childhood. Now, in those days, we did not have video games, so we had to create our own fun. My big brother, Stan, was really good at making fun. He got me involved in a home taxidermist project. We dissected many, many squirrels, <laughs> rabbits, skunks. You know, I think after that project, those projects that went on for a while, my mom would have rather had us playing video games. <laughs> but <laughs> too bad, mom. Then college. You know, college, adults expect you to make decisions and plans. How in the world are you supposed to do that? I went to college in the late 60s. I had developed a love for biology, was really good at dissecting, thanks to my brother Stan, and I wanted to do for others what Dr. Frank had done for me. So, I went the pre-med route. During the summers of my college, a dear uncle and aunt invited me to live with them in Minneapolis. I worked at Control Data, which is a mainframe computer company in Minneapolis, and I was fascinated by what computers could do in, uh, for society. Now, this was in 1968 when I was introduced to computers. And yes, 
Many of those computers are now in the museums, so you can just appreciate that. <laughs> I, I continued to study hard in college and continued to jump through all those darn hoops. And at the end of my undergraduate work, I was accepted into a great medical program. Side note, don't feel too sorry for me. I also got a 4.0 in having fun in college. So, that, you know, you can't waste your whole life. <laughs> Folks, college and plans are kind of like walking a cat on a leash. They just simply don't go together. So remember, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So two major events happen my senior year in college. A really cute guy named Gary asked me to dance and stole my heart. And I was accepted to be part of a culture exchange team to Taiwan for the summer of 1971. So, no med school, but it was okay. They gave me an extension of acceptance for a year. Let us stop praying that we really, that we love people. Let's really love them by our actions. So, it ended up, all those biology pre-med classes I had taken in college came in really handy that summer in Taiwan. We didn't do any dissecting, but after two weeks of intense cultural training, I was assigned with two other Americans to a university in Taipei. There we taught conversational English, we studied the book of Luke together. We ate rice three times together. We did a lot of traveling together. We did a whole lot of sweating together because no air conditioning and 100 degrees. Many of my graduate students would be going to Boston or England for med school. All that studying I had done in undergraduate, well, it came in really, really handy because I could teach them in conversational English the medical terms. So our Lord had a plan for all that hard study. These were fun, loving, dedicated students who made you feel like a queen, and they soon became fast friends. But I was also deeply challenged by them because many of the students were Buddhist. They could accept the fact that my God was a good God but there are many good gods. They could not accept the sovereignty of our Lord and that he had died for them. I still frequently pray for these wonderful friends because we do know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This challenge to my faith has only deepened it for life. Now, summer of 1972, I'm to start med school. However, the Lord had a different plan for me. Another summer, challenging summer, filled with adventure. My former college roommate and I went to Bruton, Alabama to be helpers in an all-day summer recreation program for elementary students. However, when we got there, we found out we were not the helpers in the program, but we were the directors for the <laughs> recreation program. So, pre-med, you have to dissect some more, right? No, we didn't. <laughs> we were in Bruton for two days, and the first bus of wonderful, playful children arrived, 60 of them. We had so much fun. And obviously, the word got out because the next day, a second bus came filled with wonderful, playful children, another 60 of them. And in the days following, more buses, and more buses, and more buses, all filled with wonderful, playful children, and more buses. Well, help! <laughs> Our cry went out. You remember, in 1972, there was not social media. 
So we had to get the word out. Many wonderful adults from their community came to help us. Nurses, police officers, mechanics, teachers, handymen, and they all heard our scream and came to our rescue. Now, Bruton in that, in 1972, was still a totally segregated city filled with uh, wonderful, wonderful people who there were rules about which streets they could be on, which drinking fountains they could drink from, and the pay scale. So it was wonderful working with these people. With them, together, we had a blast. We made 600 peanut butter sa sandwiches a day. We um, shared, did a lot of singing and dancing, shared lots of wonderful stories about Jesus, uh, played ball, sweated a whole lot, and laughed until our sides ached. I learned so much from these dear friends whose society had decided that they did not have the same rights as I did just because of the color of my skin. For some of these adults, along with the children, it was the first time that they were hearing they were wonderfully, uniquely made for a special plan. They were deeply loved by Jesus, and he had a plan for each of them. Those two summers, totally unplanned by me, taught me so much for the, and helped me through my life. And lucky for me, and I imagine for David and Leanne, Gary was still hanging around, waiting for me to get back. In the, number of, in the summer of 1973, Gary and I got married, I believe on the hottest day in history, and no air conditioning. On the morning of uh, June 1976, I was in graduate class at UNI. UNI staff came to get me for a telephone call. No cell phones in those days. It was from the Waterloo police. Gary in jail? No. He had been in a serious car accident on Rainbow Drive that morning, and I needed to go to the ER at Allen Hospital immediately. Three years earlier, just shortly before Gary and I got married, my oldest brother, Arlen, also my best friend and confidant and hero, was killed in a car accident on his way home from the airport. He was coming home from Chicago, a trip he had made many, many times, but this time it was different because he was giving his final corporate report to step away from a very prestigious position so that he could be home, he was taking another position so he could be home with his very young family. He had passed away in the ER without anyone by his side. On the way to the hospital that morning, all I could think of was, oh Lord, not again, not what just happened with our brother who we had lost. It can't be. I arrived at the ER and Gary had serious head injuries. That day and night, I cried to the Lord in anger. I said, Lord, you cannot do this again. I couldn't understand why God would allow this to happen. I, um, I, I said to the Lord, no, no. What if I had lost Gary, just like we had lost my brother? Why would you do this, God? Then the Bible verse came to me. <clears throat> we do not know what we should pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. I am not sure I had ever heard that verse before, but our Lord gave it to me that day, and he assured me it was okay to be angry. He just wanted my heart. At 25, I was devastated to the core. I screamed to the Lord. I couldn't do this by myself. There was no way. Somehow, through those weeks of surgeries, uncertainty, and pain, the Lord reassured me, I got this, Joe. Come, rest in my arms. Thankfully, I can tell you, 
Gary made a complete recovery, put up with me for another 42 years, and was in his beloved position at the John Deere Project Engineering Center. Now, none of this was a part of my plan, yet my brother's passing and Gary's accident placed the value of family at the top of our priority list, and so consequently, it changed many of my career paths. So, the career path that I had planned went a way different route, and all for the better most of the time. In the mid-1990s, uh, well into the time as a technology uh, director in a local school district, a job I loved, was challenged by, and worked with so many awesome people, a strange thing began to happen something I had never experienced before in my life. I was receiving threats to my life and to those dear to me. These threats had been deemed as surface-level harassment. They were from a colleague who believed women should not be in technology. Huh. I had been there since 1968, and I had a graduate degree in it. One day, the nature of those threats changed. The police and undercover agents decided they were valid and real. Gary, in his, all of his God-given wisdom, said, Hun, we are not going to live our lives this way anymore. So, I quickly resigned. The threats stopped. But I was 55, without a job, and absolutely no plans. I was devastated, questioning my self-worth. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. When that happens, we can hold our heads up high. Rejoice in this type of situation where you aren't even sure what your self-worth is, where you're devastated to the core. Rejoice. Because God always has a plan. A plan? Uh-huh, sure, right. The fact was, I was 55 without a plan. Yet, in those moments of silence, moments of relief because the threats were gone, moments of anger because everything I had worked for and loved was gone, the Holy Spirit calmed my soul, and that peace and understanding brought new light and hope. It paved the way for the foundation of what would become VI Telehealth, a business formed in 2006 that early on was an early work in connecting doctors and their patients and researchers from a distance. In my deep, deep, deep self-doubt and questions, our Lord reminded me, I got you, Joe. I have a plan for you. And what an incredible plan he had. When one career path ended, and I felt like the road had ended, having new insight and skills to begin a business, a business centered on technology and healthcare, connecting physicians and their patients. What a full circle moment. Beginning with a college summer job in technology and my desire to be a physician born out of a life-threatening childhood illness. Friends, this doesn't happen because we're lucky in life. This happens because in the midst of our pain, and we do not even know what we should pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and brings his works together in a way we cannot fully understand. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise God to my last breath.
until my last breath. I need to remember his plan is greater than me. His plan is greater than any earthly plan. On January 13, 2019, Mayo Clinic determined that Gary did not have one rapidly progressing cancer, but multiple rapid, rapidly progressing cancers that were caused by Agent Orange. He had been drafted as a young man to serve in Vietnam. On Thursday, February 13, 2019, one month later, we needed to say our earthly goodbyes to Gary. Many of you have lived that very same moment. How do you say goodbye to your heart and your soul, your laughter in the morning, and your lifetime dance partner? You don't. But at some point in my sorrow, grief, anger, and pain, I began to remember Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. The tomb is empty. My sorrow is here. My pain is here. But he has a plan, an incredible plan, an eternal plan. And when, before his throne, I stand in him complete, Jesus paid it all. Through my entire life, our Lord has always promised me that he would be near me and take care of me, a plan to give me hope and a future. Lord, I want to trust you, but how in the world are you going to do that? Have you ever felt that way? That from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with, the holy, with inner strength through his spirit. What I have come to realize that our Lord does take care of us in mighty, mighty ways. Frequently, he uses ordinary people. He gives us fabulous, fabulous family members. He gives us many awesome friends that are out here today. Thank you, dear friends. And sometimes he uses strangers. But they're all nudged by the Holy Spirit to reflect his care and love to us. I could give you many mighty examples of this in my life, but one was when I was a childhood with Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank, you see, had lost his little daughter to anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylaxis reaction to penicillin two years before he met me. In his deep, his and his wife's deep, deep pain and grief over losing their own precious little girl, they wanted to develop their skills, knowledge, and expertise to help others. Even using a very unconventional means that was questioned by his peers. What gave him the knowledge and the courage to do that? And oh, what a comfort to know that our Lord is there to hold us in his arms of love and comfort, no matter how life has treated us. Thanksgiving weekend of 1997, I was playing score four with my dad. While we were playing, he was telling me about a grand little niece who was very ill with a cancer, and he was feeling badly for her, except he was still whipping me in score four. But I told him, Dad, I'm sure her daddy is holding, you, holding her just like you held me when I was ill. And you held me so tightly and rocked me gently. My dad looked at me and he said, because of your extremely high temperatures, we weren't permitted to hold you. A week later, my dad very suddenly passed away. What a gift to discover. During my last earthly conversation with my dad, that it was not him holding me tightly and rocking me gently when I was ill. It was Jesus. Jesus had held me, rocked me gently, 
and given me oh such peace. And you know what? He'll do the same for you. We are all children of his, no matter our age. I have had a lot, a lot of joy in my life. So many unexpected, joy-filled, wonderful adventures, meeting fabulous friends from, from throughout the world. I also have had sorrow and disappointment. But I have tried to live out a plan that's much greater than me. For I know the plan I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. No, you are unique. You are deeply loved and a part of his plan. Thank you. Oh, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> We're just going to pray. Let's, let's pray. Pray with me, please. God, thank you for Jo. Thank you for her story. Uh, and thank you, God, that throughout her life, and even yet today, you continue to introduce yourself to her. Um, that she continues to have encounter after encounter after encounter with the living Lord. Um, and that in the hard things, the challenges, the disappointments, the sadness, all the feelings, um, that you never deserted her. That you were always there. Even when she turned away, you were waiting for her to turn back. I thank you that your Holy Spirit nudged her to keep turning back. May her story be an example of submitting, surrendering our lives to you, trusting you that in uh, any and every circumstance, you are with us, you are for us, you love us deeply, and you, you, God, have a plan for us. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>